but the, the vast majority of the collection came from Indonesia. And uh, also, it's, it's important to recognize some of the important milestones in, in the, the understanding of this type of material, so I thought I would sort of hit some of those. Um, we know that some work had been done prior to, to, uh, to, to, to the 1980s. Bueller in the 1950s had done some work with the Patola cloths. Um, but really, this sort of Indian textiles made specifically for export were, were generally mostly unknown until the 1980s. Uh, when Madabel Gittinger did her ex exhibition <coughs> of a book on uh, Master Dyers of the World, which was a, a sort of uh, introductory uh, work, and, and, and really at that time very little was known about the cloths. Uh, then in 1997 and 1998, a pair of very important uh, publications uh, came out. One was uh, uh, Ruth Barnes' work on Indian block and textiles for Egypt which are mostly fragmentary pieces that were found uh, in archaeological sites in, uh, in Egypt. And these date from everywhere from about the 5th century onwards and into the 14th, 15th century. Uh, so this is where we began to sort of get an idea about the age of some of these textiles and how long these textiles have been uh, traded into the region. Uh, then in 1998, uh, of course, uh, John pretty much spilled the beans on the uh, textiles for the Eastern markets uh, with his uh, very, very important book, Woven Cargos, which uh, was a major influence in my thinking for the exhibition. And uh, finally, the, 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 the other one that was a major influence, especially for me, was the uh, 2004 showing of Sorry to Sarong here at the ACM. And uh, as a young curator, uh, uh, very new uh, at the time, only about a year and a half into my, my career. Um, I took on the responsibility of uh, shepherding um, the, the, uh, the exhibition side of the, of the show and was able to get an introduction to these extraordinary cloths. And I think that was the most important aspect for me was, it was understanding suddenly that, in fact, Southeast Asia had textiles which go back 700 years, which really uh, was quite an amazing thing to think about at the time. So anyway, uh, some of the exhibition concepts. Um, the title of the show is Patterns of Trade, and really it's a sort of a double entendre because it, it talks about both the patterns in the cloth and also the way that the cloth was traded uh, from India to various parts of the world. And so uh, the, text, the, the, the title sort of came out of thinking about these things, and it, and it was really inspired by this particular cloth, which is one of my personal favorites, and which I uh, absolutely love seeing in the gallery. Um, and the show really was, I think the other thing that was really striking about the, the material to me was that it spoke to this term globalization which, I mean, to most people, they think of globalization as something that's very contemporary and very now. But actually, the process of globalization has been going on for literally thousands of years. And these textiles really speak to that idea of exchange, both of the material itself and also the ideas behind the material, the patterns in the trade, the trade cloths themselves. And so we begin to see, uh, you know, patterns of exchange between cultures, which are really quite extraordinary, European ideas finding their way into Indian cloths, which then find their way into Indonesian cloths, and then meld their way back into India again. And so it's not about something that's only going outward from India. It's also a conversation between all of these various markets about what is aesthetically interesting and, and how that changes over time as well, which I think is really fascinating. So I wanted to address several questions. But first of all, this exhibition was intended to be a sort of introductory show because it's a new collection for the ACM. It's a very important collection for the ACM. And we have to think in terms of down the road. Um, so I wanted to introduce this collection to our audience and also to the world. And so I wanted to answer some very basic questions like where were these textiles made? Uh, what were they used for? And where were they used? And why were these textiles so popular for such a long time? Um, and then finally, what, what are the influence of these cloths? Uh, 
I mean, you know, as I was sort of preparing for the exhibition and looking at these textiles every day, uh, and then I would go off to lunch and I would see, you know, in the hemline of a lady's dress, uh, patterns that I was absolutely certain came from some textile I'd been looking at on my computer. So it was really quite an extraordinary time for me, actually. So I structured the exhibition basically in five major segments. One is a sort of early history section where we introduce some of the, the, the early uh, factors, particularly the, the, the post-op fragments and uh, our very, very early knowledge of the material. And then uh, uh, we look at production techniques, how the textiles were made in the various places. So one of the things that we did was we wanted to bring some of the production tools which are used because these sort of help people to conceptualize how these textiles were made. And also uh, we have some of our documentation footage um, which has been hugely popular. Every time I go in the gallery I see people watching the videos rather than looking at the textiles. <laughs> so um, then of course we wanted to look at the production centers and this is a rather overcomplicated map but I couldn't find the one we used in the exhibition on my computer last night. So, um, but basically the cloths that you see in the show are largely produced uh, in uh, Coromandel Coast and in Gujarat, um, which uh, were the two, two areas where the textiles that were produced that found their way to Indonesia, um, which have survived in Indonesia. <coughs> Then uh, the next section is the section on markets, which is the sort of the, the line <coughs> of, of the exhibition. And there's a little section on uh, cloths for the Western market, particularly the European market. Uh, and then uh, Eastern markets, the Thai market, speculation a little bit about Japanese market. But again, as Dr. Uh, Chong has already said, we don't have any Japanese market material. Uh, we'd like to have that. And then, uh, of course, uh, because of the, the large number of pieces from the Indonesian uh, archipelago, we have uh, a, 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 a larger section on uh, pieces for the Indonesian market. Then the final section is a conclusion <coughs> section, which uh, there's basically two areas where, which we explore. One of them is uh, the section on innovations in, uh, in industrial production. Because Really, the Indian textiles um, drove uh, innovations, technological innovations, both when they were being produced and then also as a response to Indian textiles in Europe, uh, which leads to the Industrial Revolution, which of course has massive impact, uh, uh, which we're still, rever the reverberations of which are still going through uh, our world today. And then also a section on influences and comparisons. And, um, so I put juxtaposed some Indian pieces with European and Indonesian pieces as well to sort of show some of the, the influences and also to sort of challenge people's notions about what is and what isn't Indonesian. So, you know, even a 1970s dress, which uh, some people might question uh, as being relevant to the, the discussion, I, I wanted people to sort of uh, look at and, and start to, 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 to change their perceptions of the influences of Indian cloth. Um, and I put this, like, this in here just to sort of address the issue of flow. Uh, our gallery, as you know, uh, is a little bit uh, unique in that we have these huge columns which run through the show, so you either go clockwise or counterclockwise. And uh, in this particular case, we, we went with counterclockwise. But, uh, and then I wanted to also address a little bit uh, uh, exhibition design. When we did Sari de Sarum, in 2004, we built walls in the spaces, and these walls sort of delineated uh, um, uh, the space. But also, uh, we ended up with these very long, narrow spaces where you couldn't really see the textiles um, very well. Uh, fortunately, most of the pieces were Indonesian, so a little bit smaller than the Indian pieces, but still, you ended up sort of right up against the things, and you couldn't really see them from a distance. So as I was getting my head around how to display the show, I really was, I had another very interesting in observation and in inspiration uh, when I was home uh, for a little bit of a visit with my family, and uh, visited uh, a childhood favorite of mine, the National Museum of the United States Air Force, which uh, some of you may find 
a rather unusual place to find inspiration about Indian cloths. But uh, I absolutely love this museum. As a, as a young boy, I grew up mad about airplanes, which some of us did. And uh, my father took me here a number of times through the course of my childhood, because he also was crazy about airplanes. So, um, and we would, uh, I, I went through the space again, and I, I just loved the way you could get close to the airplanes and then you could be far away from them, the way they hung from the ceiling or were even plunked up against the wall sometimes. Um, you could walk underneath some of them. So I was really inspired by this idea of really getting around the cloths as well. And so I tried, tried to create the same sort of sense of space um, by, by having walls that held up the cloths, but only just the cloths, so that you could see through and you could actually see pieces from a distance and see what they felt like and looked like from a distance but also that you could get up nice and close and you could see what they looked like up close as well. But these look-down cases that we used, uh, we had sort of knock-down, drag-out fights in the conservation lab about the angles that they were displayed at, but I didn't want them to be flat, and the conservators <laughs> did because, of course, it's safer for the cloth. But we came up with a nice compromise where you had a little bit of an angle, and at the same time with these, uh, these, these lights which sort of wash across the cloth, and you can actually get the structure of the cloth and you can feel the texture almost without even having to touch them. Um, so these were some of the ideas. The other one was I wanted to use structures to create context. And so uh, we have things like these sort of long banner-like pieces which were used at Taraja. They would be hung up on huge poles. And uh, obviously the conservators are not going to let me dangle these things from poles, but um, we were able to select a number of pieces which were in good enough shape to be put on nice uh, flat uh, panels and, and placed up in the same sort of way. So you get the sort of sense of what they look like in real life. Uh, also the canopy display, which was uh, a, 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 another one of those aha moments where I said, you know, we should try and do this. And I went to the conservators and I said, I didn't say, you make a canopy. I said, how can we make a canopy? And they came up with a wonderful idea of doing it. And finally, I wanted to address a little bit the documentation material and uh, how we use that. Uh, again, we mentioned the, the, uh, the, the video and the display. But more importantly, I mean, um, documentation provides some context so people get a better sense of what the textiles really are and how they're made. And, and, and so context is, is, is another way for people to really experience the pieces in a little bit more of a three-dimensional sort of way. Um, and also, it, it brings things up to date, you know. I mean, it's one thing to look at a 700-year-old textile and say, wow, that's a really old textile. But it's even more interesting when you can see that there's still today things going on in the world relating to these 700-year-old textiles. So I also wanted to, to, to do that. And then, of course, for research, uh, it's very, very important. Uh, as curators, we went on three research trips in, eventually. Uh, Gary and I went uh, along with a number of other colleagues to uh, Gujarat and to uh, Coromandel Coast. And uh, it, gives us, it gives you a better sense and feel of where these things came from. And, and also, it's a wonderful experience, of course. Uh, and. Uh, then uh, lastly, just very briefly, um, I wanted to sort of sum up by sort of addressing some of the issues of the future of the collection. Uh, obviously, we hope to have more of these pieces out on permanent display. And as we work towards the revamp of the museum, we'll definitely uh, be seek looking for places to put these things out. Uh, conservation issues uh, 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 taken into account, of course. And uh, we hope to do more temporary exhibitions because, of course, uh, there's a lot of things where these textiles can be used, both in thematic shows, uh, shows about trade, um, uh, exhibitions about uh, different types of textile techniques, um, and shows about more subtle, interesting things about influences of textiles back and forth <laughs> between cultures. Then, uh, of course, traveling exhibitions. It's a great. Uh, group of pieces and we will help to put the ACM a little bit more on the map. Mm. And then I think maybe even most important of all is uh, the possibilities for further research. 
as I mentioned earlier in the talk, there's a, a, a lot that isn't known about these cloths still. And so there's a lot of areas where we do need to still do a lot more digging uh, to find out more and to, uh, to really uh, um, sort of fill in some of the blanks. So there's a good deal of potential there as well. Okay, well, um, anyway, that's pretty much all I have for you. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, I do hope you enjoy the rest of the day.